start recording and be done. Recording, fantastic. Well, I mean, right now I'm talking and it's still not showing me on the screen. No, what it's doing is it's showing when you connected from your laptop. Yeah. It's just showing the last person that had a live microphone. So when you connected to the call and it muted your mic, it's showing you last. We have seven participants on right now. If one of them was to unmute their mic and talk, they would pop up. Okay, but when I start teaching, what? That's it. Now, this is just this is just for display. This has nothing to do with what the Zoom crowd is seeing or what's being recorded. This is just for your view. Oh, I see. Okay. For you personally, that's right. For you or anyone else in the room. Yeah, I think the way Sam had it was uh, I could just see myself. Yeah, I mean that doesn't really do anything for you. I mean, unless you want to see that. Um, but we have it set. I usually set it like this. That way, if someone asks a question, you see them. Yeah. That way, when you hear their voice come out somewhere, you're not looking around to see where they are. Okay. Okay. That sounds good as long as the recording oh, yeah. looks like you say it'll work. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this is just for room display. All right. Thank you. Well, you're not going to get everything. Yeah, I understand. I understand. But, but I made clear what the priorities are. Good, good. Yeah. Well, this is the least I can do. <laughs> What's the history of these tricks with part with partos? Um, well, I mean, there's a paper by Jane where he talked about it and at the level of wave functions. I mean, he says, okay, if you make this part on this, you know, all of this here, uh, and then you simply write down these objects uh, in the uh, part on wave function. And so no, more generally, use, using patterns, this I think was before before Jane. People use this trick of writing some operator on the lattice as a product of others. Uh, well, um, I mean, I guess uh, I would say it first appeared in the condo problem with people called the slave boson method. Oh. Not exactly this, but close to it. Uh, uh, so that was a uh, writing the electron as a product of a boson and another fermion. Okay, uh, maybe that's where I saw that. Yeah, uh, but it's as been, I was saying- It's like, been in the, in the 70s. Well, no, that was 80s. That was 80s? But, but there in the end, you, the slave boson effectively was always condensed. Ah. So it never led to any fractionalized phases. Ah. So it was just a, like a, uh, like a tool, like a uh, some but which you, which you know, people did that with CPN. They said that there's a field n, yeah, and they wrote it in terms of z's. So that that was clearly yes, uh, yes, that was. But that's again, that's in one plus one dimension where yeah, again no, the z's are confined. So it works in any number of dimensions. Uh, well, but they're confined because there's a uh, there's yeah. a compact view on gauge field. No, no, not necessarily. 
you can do it in three plus one dimension. Three plus one, it will be combined. I haven't, I didn't see any statement of that. Uh, I saw that. Well, I, I, I learned about it from uh -huh. Tom Banks, you know, in the round 81, 82. Oh, I see. Okay. He didn't claim to invented that. It was kind of something that everybody knew. That, that somehow the O3 model could have a deconfined phase? Yeah. Okay, I, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. I mean, in the kinetic mode, I would say when you're using power downs to get a fractionalized phase, I would say that was probably Bhaskar and Anderson in 87, 88. Yeah. Also, oh, so late. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> it's time. I guess it, uh, and it's very much bigger in India, so I should get started. So can you hear me online? Someone say yes? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, great. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, finish our discussion of the fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, and there's probably a bit more than I thought uh, there was uh, on Friday or on Wednesday. So we'll see how far I get. Well, I, I think I should finish it all today. And then the next topic will be rather different. Uh, the condo effect. Uh, and we'll uh, get back to basics really there. So if you got a bit lost with all the topology and the fractionization and gauge fields, uh, don't worry, they're going to come back down to earth. <laughs> all right. So the, this is the, the part on construction, which uh, is a very useful way to think about things. Uh, it not only gives you uh, a trial wave function, but it also gives you an understanding of the X states and the excitations. And I'll do a little bit of that today. So for the most important quantum Hall states, the main part of our idea is to, is to decompose the electron uh, into two fermions, psi one, psi two, psi three. Uh, and if you impose this constraint that the densities of all these fermions are equal, then uh, as long as you impose the constraint exactly, you haven't, uh, uh, you're still solving the same problem. The Hilbert space remains the same. Uh, just that you have uh, more degrees of freedom uh, to work with. Okay, now the idea is that you're going to look at some mean field of this uh, parton theory. And the mean field will be such that the partons themselves occupy uh, an integer number of uh, Landau levels. So this is the all important relation between the filling factor and the density of a fermion. We just divide the density by the number of flux quanta. So D is uh, per air per unit area. So D uh, is the magnetic field and fine art is the flux quanta. So, so this is a dimensionless number because both are densities uh, and the step in the filling fraction. So when nu is one, you fully fill the lowest band of All right, now because the densities of all the three fermions are the same, the same row, uh, then and if V1 is the field experienced by the first fermion, V2 by the second, and V3 by the third, then the filling fraction um, of the first fermion is just rho over V1 over phi naught. And this we ask to be an integer. Uh, similarly for V2 and V3. And now you just take these equations and put them together, uh, and you get this very important equation relating the filling fraction uh, to these integers n1, n2, n3, which at this point can be anything. All right, so, so from this, as I showed you last time, if you just take the simplest case, n1 equals n2 equals n3 equals one, uh, you get the Laughlin wave function uh, as your uh, uh, trial wave function that of the part of state. Now with, I want to say a bit more about fluctuations about the, of the Laughlin state and other states. So then there are gauge fields, and here's a nice table which summarizes, uh, which you can look at and it has a lot of information. So there's, you have two constraints, psi dagger one, uh, psi one equals psi dagger two, psi two. And associated with that constraint, you can introduce a gauge field I call V1. And this is, these are the charges. So this means that psi one has charge one on the gauge field V1 and psi two has charge minus one. Uh, so that way the charge with respect to this is psi dagger one, psi one minus psi dagger two, psi two. Uh, which has to be zero, and uh, that's a useful way to assign the charges. And similarly, B2 is one and minus one. Of course, there's many different ways of assigning this. Uh, it doesn't matter, I pick one way, 
uh, and if you do the calculation right in the end, the, the physical response function of the gauge invariant operator will be the same. Okay. All right. Any questions? Okay. So then what I haven't done, but is actually now very straightforward, uh, given what we did for the Carl spin liquid, uh, is the theory of the X case. So now we take the case uh, N1 equals N2 equals N3 equals 1, uh, and I'm going to look at the X states. So each of these Landau levels are uh, of the partons uh, is just uh, is fully filled. They're just occupying the lowest Landau level. And as I showed explicitly, I think last time, uh, there's an X state uh, associated with each fully filled Landau level uh, for these fermions. And then the X state is a chiral fermion, which we can uh, bosonize. So basically I'm going to get, uh, uh, and the Lagrangian for the edge um, will be the same for all three of them. Sum on i equals one to three, or uh, one over four pi. Um, and you have some velocity, the i of uh, the x by i squared uh, plus i of the x. Um, phi the tau phi phi i. Okay, so these are this is just a Bosonac's way of uh, writing down uh, the fact that there's one chiral fermion at the edge of each of the of the Landau levels, and the velocities of e i they may not be equal, uh, and this is just uh, this is a strange looking boson. It's a chiral boson, and this is the Lagrangian form of the commutation relations the bosons must obey. So I, I, I realize this is opaque to people who haven't seen lead in the liquid theory, but sorry about that. Uh, we're not going to use this much later in the course, but here, this is one place where this is very useful uh, because it's very easy now to account for the gauge field in the bosonized formulation. Okay. Uh, all the factors right there. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Okay, so then we also have the gauge fields, V1 and V2, uh, and they're going to couple uh, to the respective uh, currents of these bosons. So you'll have one of them with V1, uh, plus I, B, V1 mu, epsilon mu nu, uh, D mu phi, uh, phi one up here, minus phi two, um, and the whole thing divided by two pi. And then you also have this here, uh, plus I B2 mu of epsilon mu mu, D mu phi two minus D mu phi three from the table of charges divided by two pi. Okay, so now this is a theory of three chiral bosons and two U1 gauge fields. Uh, there can be a higher derivative terms that you can add, but they're not important in the infrared. So, however, now the action of the gauge field is extremely simple, just like in the chiral spin liquid. Uh, it basically says phi one must equal phi two and phi two must equal phi three uh, up to constants. So from the gauge field integration, Um, you get uh, phi one equals phi two plus constant, and phi two equals phi three plus constant. Okay, um, and then you can plug that back in into the original action. So you get a very simple theory for the edge. There's only one phi to worry about, and now the L edge uh, is just equal to one over four pi. Times V1 plus V2 plus V3 Vx by squared plus three 
uh, times del x, uh, just as an i there, uh, del x phi, del tau phi. Okay. Um, so this, this v is a dimensionless, uh, I mean, dimensionless full number, it determines the velocity of the x mode, can be anything, depends on all kinds of details. Uh, but the number in front of this term is not up to you. It's, it's something that's uh, really determined the nature of the chiral boson. Uh, it's called the level of the U1 Katsumuri uh, algebra, uh, if for those of you who know what these things are. Uh, in the notes, you can find some simple calculations of correlation functions of these bosons, uh, where you just do the Gaussian integral over the phi. And from those correlation functions, you'll see explicitly that these numbers kind of drop out as prefactors of various correlation functions. Uh, but this number here is really important in terms of the exponents uh, of various correlators. So, so the net result, not too surprising, is something we already saw in the chiral spin liquid. Uh, so you have a U1 smoothie at level, in this case, K equals three. This three is this three over here, uh, which is the three also of the, yeah, of the Katsumuri algebra and contrast that to level two that we have for the chiral spin liquid. Okay, so the exponents are a bit different, but the whole logic is very similar. We'll see in this normalizations would have an e to the three phi. Um, so you could, yeah, so you have to go back and carry this through. So you use that representation. So psi one, right? I think that's right. Psi one is like e to the i phi one. Uh, and then you use a constraint and you use that, and you'll see the electron operator is e to the i three i phi. So on. So some of that's in the notes, and I wrote it long enough ago that I don't remember the details, but I think that's right. <laughs> Should we consider we also have the e to the i phi operator? Or... Uh, that's not gauge invariant, uh, you know, because the phi one but just this the, the phi that you have here in the end. What exponents are allowed for the phi? Yeah. Okay. I think that this e to the i phi one operator is a quasi particle operator. Okay. Uh, it's a, it creates a one third charge. Um, so in the bulk, uh, it will create something many odds, uh, but there's no physical probe on the boundary that will be a e to the i phi. Right? You always, you always get three of them. Yeah. So all of that can be done, and I'm not going through it, partly because I haven't really covered all the background for many of the students. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, yes. Are those constant most important for anything? No, no, no. That's, they come into the normalization of these operators, which is often very complicated. So if you're solving an integrable point, then you maybe have to keep track of it, get the normalization right. Uh, yeah, if you have an integrable model, then, then you can do things with those constants, but in general, no. <laughs> uh, Okay, so now I want to do another interesting case, uh, which is, as you'll see, is a very interesting combinations of things you have learned and something you have new. Uh, so now we'll talk about the more rate state at new inputs one half. So let's talk about the more rate state. And I certainly be able to go all the details of it, but I. Hopefully I'll give you the general idea, the basic construction of how from the cartons and putting together many things we've already learned, uh, you can understand the structure of the state, many aspects of it. All right, so the more ring state corresponds to taking N1 equals one, N2 equals one, uh, and N3 equals infinity. Uh, so that new um, is one half, so you spin this electrons at half filling. Uh, so half filling, you cannot get a, uh, a Laughlin fraction uh, because, well, uh, these numbers, so the news are always odd for any finite n1, n2, n3. Um, but uh, at this point, you, you, to get a gap state, you have to do a bit more. 
So as I mentioned last time, this means that the side three fermions form a Fermi surface, at least to begin with. This is momentum space, Fermi surface. Um, and so this is going to be paired uh, and we're going to pair it uh, to, to create a gap. If you have a Fermi surface, then you have the metallic state, which is the husband B reed state. But if you want a fractional quantum Hall state uh, with a gap and anionic excitations, uh, then you do have to get rid of the Fermi surface. And the simplest way to get rid of it uh, is to pair the fermions. So, so gaps uh, by fermion pairing. So fermion pairing, as we learned in BCS theory, uh, in this case, it's side three is a function of momentum. Okay, now there's no spin. Um, so it's really what you call odd parity pairing, or, you know, which it does happen in helium three. Um, so it, it's, there's no spin index. So this thing has to be anti-symmetric in P uh, just from the fermion anti commutation relation. Uh, so unlike an S-wave or a D-wave superconductor, uh, the right-hand side must be an odd function of P, not an even function of P. Uh, and the simplest function that we'll be interested in uh, at long wavelengths is Px plus I Py. Okay. So we, this is very natural here because time reversal symmetry is already broken. You could take other possibilities, uh, but they don't give you the interesting more reach structure. Yes. I, to, I was just going to ask what's wrong with Px. You could take that. It would just give you a, a different state, uh, which would certainly not have non be in any of us. <laughs> So there's another criterion that you need to satisfy for to get the interesting structure of the Mori state, and that's what I'm going to not discuss. So let's see. Uh, hit that table. So let's do this over here. So let's think about the gauge structure now. So the side three fermions have paired up and formed a gap. Now we saw. Uh, in the very beginning of the discussion of spin liquids, we saw precisely this phenomenon, but we did it with bosons, where you had a theory that had a U1 gauge symmetry uh, when you write the spin in terms of bosonic partons, and then you paired the bosons and you got the Z2 spin liquid. So exactly the same thing is happening here. So what we learned from this, since the side three fermions carry the V2 gate charge, uh, so the V2, uh, U1 gauge symmetry um, has been uh, broken down to, or Higgs to, let me say Higgs. So this this fermion pair is a Higgs like a Higgs condensate, and this has been Higgs down to Z2. So you really have a Z2 gauge theory left over that we have to worry about, and we'll worry about it uh, in a minute. But what about V1? Well, V1 is in fine shape. V1 only couples with Psi1 and Psi2, and Psi1 and Psi2 form fully filled Landau levels. So what we see that Psi1 and Psi2 and V1 have exactly the same structure as in the chiral spin liquid. So, so V1, Side one, side two, these fields, if you take them together, it gives you essentially the chiral spin liquid. So by this, I mean, you have edge states with cat's moody algebra level equals two, um, and you have, you know, any on semionic excitations uh, associated with that, okay? So roughly speaking, the theory splits into two sectors. Uh, there's a sector of B1, side one, side two, which is a chiral spin liquid. Uh, and then there's a sector that we'll now discuss, uh, which is a Z2 gauge field coupled to fermions, which form P plus IP pairing. Um, and the more reach state is a combination of these two structures. That's a, I forget, I don't know what the technical term is, 
there is more than a non-trivial coupling because uh, this uh, psi two also carries this Z two gate charge. So we have to keep track of that. Uh, that that imposes certain rules on the structure of the anion, which I'm not going to go, to, go into. <laughs> All right. So so what we have found is that the, at the Maurice state there are two separate sectors, the chiral spin liquid sector, and there's a sector here with a Z2 gauge field. Okay. So this is the sector we're gonna focus on. And this particular sector, so I'm gonna add here, uh, this is gonna be a Z2 gauge field here. Now there's another model which has exactly the same structure. Uh, and that's the Kite of uh, honeycomb lattice model. Which you know, has a great deal of interest these days because I think there's some indications, partial indications that it may be found in ruthenium chloride or something. So Kite started with a spin system and zero magnetic field with lots of spin orbit coupling. The spin orbit coupling was crucial because in that uh, formulation that got rid of the spin index as an independent conserved index. Uh, so you're effectively dealing with spinless fermions, which is the important thing. Uh, and his Majorana construction leads naturally, in fact, uh, to this kind of paired state. But I'm going to all right, deal with it at a much more pedestrian level, as you'll see, uh, but you get the same structure. So this is kind of the relationship between uh, the Kitev model and the Maurit model. Uh, the Maurit model is a bit more complicated uh, because also got an extra, uh, extra component here uh, that you don't have here. The Kitev model really, you know, as is typical of Kitev, uh, stripped down to the basics and simplest possible thing, which has the essential structure. <laughs> okay, so we're going to just talk about this and ignore that now. All right, so we want to write down a theory, I'll put it on a lattice of spinless fermions, which pair with this pairing signature with a gauge field. Or a Z2 gauge field. Okay, so we just write down a very general simple theory of that and ask about its properties. I'm just going to talk about uh, spinless from uh, odd parity pairing, odd parity superfluid coupled to a Z2 gauge field. Oh, I'm just I'm going to put it on a lattice and I'll just write a very simple Hamiltonian for this. So now I'm going to just to keep it in my notes, I'm going to replace psi three uh, by f. I won't write psi three all over again. And let me just get sure you can write notes. Yes. So here's a, going to be a Hamiltonian. Uh, so you get minus, okay, just to make sure I get the same notation, mu, mu minus 4t. I put it on a square lattice. Uh, okay, it's f dagger i, f i, minus t, some of nearest neighbors. Sigma Z I J. J. Then I will have some pairing from one nearest neighbors, delta I J of F dash I, F dash J.
Um, and then you can also make the uh, have the usual trial for the for gauge field product of squares of sigma z on the links. Oh, well, let me find it. You know, okay. <laughs> Uh, and then minus G sum of I J of sigma X. So this is the usual Wagner Hamiltonian for a Z2 gauge field. And I've coupled it to fermions to carry a Z2 gauge charge, hence the factors of sigma Z I here, uh, and also over here, sorry. Um, and then the fermions have some hopping and some pairing delta i. Okay, so what are the various constraints? Any such time of time must satisfy. First of all, you can see delta i j must be anti symmetric. That's delta j i. And so it has an orientation. And then under the gauge transformation, there's a gauge invariance uh, sigma z. Ij goes to rho i sigma z ij rho j uh, fi goes to rho i times fi and sigma x uh, goes to sigma x. Okay, so this is a Z2 bona fide Z2 gauge theory. It also has matter fields, uh, the matter fields of these fermions, uh, which have this pairing. All right. So we are, of course, interested in the deconfined phase of the Z2 gauge field. Uh, if you make G very large, as we saw, you go to the confined phase, then you know you lose all the structure and who knows what state you get. You probably get some, uh, who knows, in this case, maybe some kind of charge density wave state or something like that. Uh, so we want G basically zero or small or K very large. So that sigma Z is almost a constant. Um, and then we have some fermions moving in the background uh, of these Z2 gauge fields. Okay. Um, and finally, I'm, I'm going to specify the delta ij also. And they're going to be the following uh, delta i i plus x at it's only nearest neighbor, I'll call it delta. And delta i i plus y hat would be i times delta. So this is important. Uh, first of all, as we'll see, it's important for getting a gap and, um, and also preserving square lattice symmetry uh, when you look at the spectrum of gauge invariant objects. Um, and also important for the topological state, nature of the state. In this case, there's the band topology that I'm most interested in. Okay. All right, so here's a Hamiltonian, a well-defined Hamiltonian on a square lattice. Uh, and we'd like to study its phases. So uh, I haven't seen any complete study of this Hamiltonian. Uh, probably it's not so easy to do on the computer. Uh, but certainly I think we can, with some confidence, say something about what happens at small g, uh, which is what I'll describe. All right, everyone understand the problem we're going to address now. So this, this effective Hamiltonian, uh, is a complete description anywhere in the sense of universal properties of the honeycomb, the Kitev honeycomb phase. Yeah. Just to check, F is a spinless Fermi. Correct. Yes, that's important, of course. Um, yes. So there's no spin index on F. Now, in the Kitev model, there is a spin index, but there's also a lot of spin orbit. It's not conserved in all, you know, it's you know, the X, Y, and Z components of the spin mix with each other. Uh, well, at least of the fermion. So in the end, once you you get a big matrix, and when the dust settles, uh, you see that the structure is the same that you get in a spinless fermion tree. Okay. All right. So so we're going to study this, and so the reason I didn't do this earlier, of course, when I talked about zeta spin liquids. Uh, is because there's a bit of band topology here that we need. Uh, so we don't want to take this dispersion to be any old dispersion, in particular mu and t must have a certain relation to obtain the interesting state 
uh, that, that has the novel properties. You know, one possible phase fate of this theory is just a Z2 spin liquid uh, where the fermions are gapped uh, and the Z2 gauge field is defined. Uh, and then you're back to the Z2 spin liquid that we studied uh, in the first part of the course. But it turns out that there's another possible phase which is also gapped uh, in this theory, but is not the Z2 spin liquid. It's the phase that's sometimes called Ising topological orbit. All right, so we, let's take the limit g going to zero uh, and sigma z is just one. Pick the gauge so that sigma z is one, so we ignore it. Uh, and so then we have a free fermion Hamiltonian, which we have to go ahead and diagonalize. And we want to, of course, diagonalize it in a way uh, that there'll be some interesting band topology. So you can write it this way. Is one half sum of p um, into a Fourier transform psi dagger p of the Bogdanov Bijan Hamiltonian of p. So this is you know completely standard things we did in some detail for a D-wave superconductor. Do exactly that here, uh, and psi p is the Nambu spinner. It mixes f p and f dagger of minus p. Okay, now when we had spin, the number spinner was f p up and f dagger minus p down. So the up and down components of the number spinner were measuring different fermions. One must spin up, one must spin down. Here it's measuring the same fermion. And that's actually key to everything. Uh, and the factor of one half that I put out front. So this number spinner obeys a, a reality condition that psi dagger of p is equal to psi transpose of minus p uh, times tau x. Okay, so there's a reality condition or a particle hole symmetry. Uh, if you know a little bit about the 10 4 way, this particle hole symmetry is absolutely crucial to the classification of the 10 fold way. Uh, so this is a Hamiltonian in two dimensions, uh, which has particle hole symmetry and no other symmetry. I forget what, I think that's class B, if you know the 10, 10 fold classes of Cartan. Anyway, so we're interested in this, this particular Hamiltonian, uh, which is just a uh, superconductor. Okay. So, and then what is HPDG? Well, here's one easy way to write it out. So this tau is, of course, a matrix that acts in the number space. Uh, so HBDG turns out to be dx of p times tau x plus dy of p tau y plus dz of p times tau z. And this vector d of p Is minus two delta sine dx um, minus two delta sine py and two minus mu minus cosine px minus cosine py. Okay. Uh, okay, and then my notes I've set t equal to one half, so I Okay, so of course, this is just the hopping in the Z component. These are the two pairing terms. Um, and the Hamiltonian has been written this very suggestive way. So, what you see is uh, it's the Hamiltonian of a spin a half, fictitious spin a half particle in a magnetic field. But, and the magnetic field is a function of momentum and has X, Y, and Z components of this D vector. Zeeman field. Okay. Uh, and of course, this is very easy to diagonalize. Uh, the eigenvalues are are plus or minus square root of uh, mod, uh, basically mod vector of d of p. 
so the eigenvalues come uh, in equal in pairs of equal and opposite signs, uh, and that's again a consequence of uh, of this particle hole uh, symmetry, uh, which also has an action on HPDG. Well, let me check it right here. <coughs> the, the, the transpose of the BDG Hamiltonian is minus tau x h t p times tau x. So these are the kind of complicated relations that are crucial to this tenfold classification of topological insulators and superconductors. Um, and this is the class D okay. All right. Which, yeah. which, where is the honeycomb? The what? The honeycomb. You mentioned that this is called the honeycomb. Model. Well, uh, this I put it on a square lattice, but you could put it on a honeycomb lattice. That would change the dispersion, and it's more complicated, in fact. But is it? So it seems like it's not essential to put it on the honeycomb. No, it's not essential. No. What's right. essential is to get the uh, uh, the churn number that I'm just now going to describe. As long as the churn number, so this is this has an integer churn number, and as long as it's non-zero, uh, in fact, it has to be odd. Uh, you will get the structure I'm going to talk about. All right. So once you have this Hamiltonian. Uh, then, and I made the connection to the uh, a fictitious particle in a, in a Zeeman field. Uh, it has a churn, it has an invariant which characterizes band structure. So this Hamiltonian is periodic under uh, P plus G is H B D G P. So where G is a reciprocal lattice vector of the square lattice in this case. Um, and so it's a map, the Hamiltonian you can view as a map from the torus to this D vector. And the D vector, uh, after rescaling it, you can put on a sphere of more formally, uh, it lives on uh, R3 minus the origin. So it never, all three of them never vanish. Uh, and so that particular map has a topological invariant, which is how many times you wrap around here. So if I apply sorry, can you explain again the sphere? Uh, but I'll just write it down and then, then we'll discuss it. Uh, okay. So this has a, something very similar with the churn number. Uh, and the, really the only difference with churn numbers that we discussed earlier uh, for, uh, for Stephanos and Mikwek uh, is the fact that there's this reality condition and that P and minus P are not independent points. So there's various factors that one half. Uh, and as we'll see, the edge states are not complex fermions, but real fermions uh, because of that. So there's a churn number. It's exactly the churn number I've gone before, but now I'm writing it down from by analogy to the problem of a, of a spin in a magnetic in a Zeeman field. So you just have to count uh, the number of times uh, this map from the torus to the sphere. P of T over bar P of T cubed Okay, so you have your blue one zone. And this is being mapped into essentially the unit sphere. This is the sphere where this is d hat, which is d over mod d. So at every point of the one zone, there's a unit vector, which is mod d is never zero. Uh, and you're just counting how many times this map wraps around the sphere. 
So that's a topological invariant. It doesn't change uh, as you vary any parameter as long as mod d doesn't go to zero. Um, so it's uh, very much like the churn number, it's very rigid uh, and it controls certain important topological properties of the eigenstates of this Hamilton. Okay. Should we identify the point P with minus P in the pre drawing zone or not? Um, well, then you'd have to put, you know, I'm integrating over the whole. Uh, this is an integer defined this way. Right. Now, when I come to the edge states, I do have to do that. But right now, the Hamiltonian is the same. Right, correct. But I, I still make, yeah, I'm, but this statement is nevertheless true. I just, if I make this integral with this normalization, this is an integer. That's all I'm claiming at this point. I will have to remember that, but not in defining this. Okay. So, but I mean, I'm not going to go into the details. The details are, there are a few more details of the notes. Uh, so there must be, because of the non-zero turn number, uh, so there are chiral edge states. Um, and then because P and minus P are identified, Um, you can rewrite them uh, as a chiral Myron fermion. So, for those of you who know these things, uh, the, the chiral central chart is one half, not one, uh, precisely because of this condition. And I go through this explicitly in the notes uh, how you go from, you know, chiral. I mean, basically what you do, you just first ignore this fact and go ahead and write down the edge states. Uh, and then you impose this constraint on the boundary theory and you'll see you'll just get the theory of a chiral myra, myra fermion. I'll do a little bit of that when I talk about uh, zero modes, but for the edge states, it's very similar. Okay. All right. And, and and one other important thing to remember that this invariant is goes you know in the, in the his class in class D with the invariant is Z not Z two. You can get any number of Karamara and fermions for different dispersions, and it's stable at least for free fermions. If you put in interactions on the in the in the bulk, uh, there's a, some very complicated Z sixteen classification of these states. So we won't need that here. 16 Myra fermions, we feel the interactions are true <laughs> on the edge. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so that's the edge states. But there's another very interesting thing that I want to mention, uh, which is what about the excitations? Um, and this Z2 gauge field will uh, also be very important here. And again, I'm not going to go into the details because you know, that will, once you start going to all this stuff, is a whole wide subject of these band topology on which, for example, there's a book by Bernadette and Hughes, which goes into a lot of these cases in much detail. So we won't need that for the other cases I think we're going to talk about. So what about excitations? Um, well, let me schematically write down the Hamiltonian. Um, I had a Z2 gauge field, F sigma Z, F dagger F, sigma Z, F, F. Um, and then you also had a product on the loop of sigma Z uh, minus G and sigma X. So one class of excitation. So first of all, the fermion sector, uh, we are still looking at the regime where uh, K is much, much bigger than G. And so sigma z in the ground state uh, is just one. Well, in the ground state, it's one. And in a minute, we're going to see some excited states where it's not one. OK, so, so one class of excitations 
uh, we've already seen. They're right here. We have these fermionic excitations, um, which have energy mod of dt. And if this was a zeta spin liquid, those would be the epsilon particles. The fermions and they carry a Z2 gate charge. Uh, and these are present even in, the, uh, in this model. Um, but there's another excitation here, which we spent so much time on in the first part of the course. Uh, and that's the M particle of the Vizon. So I could take another configuration of the sigma Z uh, and the Z2 gates theory has another gap excitation within the M particle, which is, you know, I, let me put one here and one here. Uh, I call this the M particle, but I put it in quotes uh, because it's going to become something different. And there's a branch path connecting them, for example, along this line. Uh, and on this line, uh, sigma Z is minus one. So how much energy does this cost? Well, to reading order, if I ignore the fermions, um, there's a flux with a cost 2K here, uh, and there's a cost 2K here, because uh, you're going from sigma Z all one around this plaquette, to sigma Z, product of sigma Z minus one, and minus one over there. All of the plaquettes still have product of sigma Z plus one, so they don't cost anything. So there's just a finite energy cost to create the flow. So what we have to do now uh, is to take this configuration of sigma z and then diagonalize the fermion in Hamiltonian again. Okay, so when we did the fermion in the ground state, we found things on the edge. But now we, we take an infinite sample, but with two, two of these Vizons uh, with Z2 gauge flux. Uh, and we have to ask, what does the fermionic spectrum look like? All right, so there's again, uh, some fairly sophisticated topology associated with that. Uh, let me just tell you the answer, and then we have kind of done with this topic uh, with the following. So what we have to do now is take this configuration of sigma z um, and diagonalize this part of the matrix. Now there's really no momentum left over. There's no translational symmetry. So you just get a bunch of eigenvalues. Okay, so you can look at them. So here's energy. Now, the bulk spectrum, you know, um, has a gap. So there's a, and it's symmetric around the zero energy. This is zero. So there'll be some eigenvalue of the probability of the general Hamiltonian, which will be at the minimum of mod of D of phi. And this will be minus the minimum of D of P. And you get a whole bunch of states. Okay. So now you take this system and do it, put it on a computer, I urge you to do it. It's more fun. Uh, you get a whole bunch of states here, and a whole bunch of states here. But you will find, uh, and this is not something I'm going to prove, that as long as nu, uh, let's take the case that nu is one, uh, then you'll also get two very special states, uh, which will be right here. Um, and they're spacing, so they'll, let's call them epsilon zero and minus epsilon zero. Um, and epsilon zero will be uh, exponential times constant times L, very small. Where L is the spacing between these two. So if you move them far enough apart, there is you know, one set of pair of zero energy levels. So what is the effect of Hamiltonian here? Just describe these two levels. So just for these two levels, I can write on a very simple Hamiltonian, which is epsilon zero times two, some eigenmode of these, the boggle of eigenmode is a complex fermion, gamma dagger, no, let me call it, what I call it my notes. This is not in the notes. <laughs> um, 
I call it uh, eta. Okay, so there will be some eta of eta dagger eta minus one, where eta is some eigenvector of HBDG, just the usual way to diagonalize the boundary of Dijon Hamiltonian and get some fermionic eigenvectors, complex fermionic. Uh, and now you can see that eta dagger eta uh, is uh, either one or zero. And so you will get exactly these eigenmodes, one here and one there. Okay. So that's quite interesting. But even more interesting is, is the following statement. So let's rewrite this in terms of real fermions. This is where I'm going to introduce my run of fermions. So we introduce an object called gamma one, which is eta plus a dagger, and gamma two, which is minus i eta minus eta dagger. Eta and eta dagger are canonical fermions. Eta dagger plus eta one. So these are called Majorana fermions. They are roughly the real and imaginary part of eta. Uh, and in these terms of these fermions, H effective um, is basically something very simple. It's I epsilon naught times gamma one, gamma two. Okay. All right, but the most remarkable thing um, is the nature of the wave function itself. So when you have diagonalized the H buggy of the Hamiltonian to get these eigenvalues, you also get eigenvectors. So, you know, do this, it's fun. You get a complicated eigenvector and you want to look at the eigenvector of these states. Uh, and in fact, you want to look at the component of the eigenvector associated with the real and imaginary part. Gamma one with the real part, gamma two with the imaginary part. What you'll find uh, is that these eigenvectors will be strongly localized. So there's one eigenvector here, which will be gamma one, and there'll be another eigenvector here, which will be gamma two. So effectively, when you take that other on out to infinity, you're left with half a fermion uh, on this uh, object. Uh, so there's a Majorana zero mode, it is called, uh, and there's a Majorana zero mode sitting uh, on this M particle. What was initially an M particle, because of the topology in the band structure, uh, becomes a more complicated object. I forget what it's called. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I think it's the Ising field or some Ising operator. Uh, it's one Majorana fermion. Then even more amazing, which uh, I am not going to talk about, then you can talk about then what about the braiding statistics um, of these objects? What happens when you take them around each other? Um, okay, I have some notes on that, but that's taking too far afield for this course. And what you find is that these objects now have a non-abelian uh, braiding statistics. You have to take four of them. Uh, then the Hilbert space uh, has you know, uh, total of four states, and then there's some interesting matrix elements uh, associated with the braiding of these objects. Uh, and that can all be worked out just by knowing uh, what I've written on the board, that there's this branch pattern and every time a minor and a fermion crosses the branch pair to fix it a minus one. That's really all you need to know. Uh, and the fact that these Majoranas are separately localized on these different particles. All right, so those are remarkable, beautiful properties that follow simply from the fact that the spin-on spectrum has this, or in the context of the Honeycomb model, it's a spin-on, uh, or this part-on in the quantum Hall problem um, has this non-trivial non churn number. And it's half a churn number because of the pairing. Uh, and that's really the only fundamental difference from, from the churn number we first met for the integer quantum Hall effect and churn insulators. We didn't have that factor of a half. When you have that half, uh, then you get all these very exotic phenomena. All right, I think that's all I plan to say about the fractional quantum Hall effect, really about uh, all these non abelian all the abelian and non abelian phases. Uh, and we want to get down to more mundane topics, but also very interesting topics 
in the remainder of the course. Yeah. What's the experimental situation in all this? Uh, well, so there's, I would say, well, for the place where people have directly been looking for Majorana uh, are on these wires. You take a superconducting wire, uh, and no, no, you take a, a wire with large spin orbit coupling and you put it on top of a superconductor and then you put a magnetic field. And the combination of all this is sufficient to give you uh, Majorana zero mode at the end of the chain. So that's, that's a 1D topology. It's a slightly different class from the class I've been considering here, but it, it's similar. Uh, so there you get the Majorana's uh, at the ends of the wire rather than in the bulk here. Um, and then you want to make different configuration of these wires and uh, somehow entertain them in some complicated way so that it becomes effectively two dimensional by having wires go in different directions. Uh, so, there I, I would say that there's quite strong evidence of seeing the Majorana at the end of the wire. Uh, there was an initial paper by Leo Kovenhaven and collaborators. Uh, which was recently retracted uh, because some of the claims in that initial paper were, didn't hold up. I don't know the details. Uh, that unfortunately cast a, a negative light on the whole field because, but it shouldn't really, as far as detection of myron is concerned, because that's an initial paper. There are many other papers did it much better later, uh, where there's no question that they have very good evidence for myron. Uh, so, so it is mainly a question of credit rather than achievement <laughs> of what has been achieved. Um, so yeah, have, but now you have to break this, and uh, yeah, that's completely up in the air. I don't know so how they're going to do this. Have convincing evidence. Well, Leo himself in subsequent papers, and also Charlie Marcus, uh, of course, this uh, Ali's uh, experiment here, but that's not as convincing, I think. But I, I, I would say it's a settled issue. I mean, I, I still see papers. Uh, where various people saying that this hasn't been ruled out and that hasn't been ruled out. But the most, I think that I would say the most natural assumption for what's been observed is that there is a myron at the end of, uh, of this wire. Um, but that's not this system. This is No, 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 it's a simpler system in a way. Um, because this is two plus one dimensional. Yeah, so, so that's a one dimensional system. But to get any, you know, braiding, you do have, you do need 2D. Uh, and there's some very clever ideas. You take wires that cross with each other and you connect them in different ways. I don't think that's anywhere got off the ground, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that Microsoft has, of course, invested in a big way in that effort, uh, but they seem to be, I think they're very unhappy because, at least in the press, the efforts by Amazon and Google are getting much more play because they have, you know, Many more qubits, 50 qubits, where Microsoft so far doesn't even have one. Uh, but on the other hand, at least they're trying to uh, make it a stable qubit, which will uh, be fault tolerant. Uh, so they're at least addressing the hard problem, whereas Google and others are, well, just hoping for the best, which is a bit naive, but you know. <laughs> yeah. What, what about these? Uh... Any on experiments that were done for new equals one third, is there any hope for extending those to new equals one half? Directly observing? Um, yeah, so those are very high magnetic fields. Uh, and as far as I know, nobody's really, that's much harder because of the very high magnetic fields and low, low temperatures needed. Uh, at least as far as I know, Microsoft has uh, abandoned that effort, but you know. <laughs> Uh, then there was in the 2D, uh, there's claims of um, in lutetium chloride, it's a 2D crystal of observing Majorana edge states uh, from, uh, from the thermal Hall effect, where this, you get a central charge one half. There was some indication that there was a central charge one half at the edge of lutetium chloride. Uh, that wasn't very good evidence to begin with. And uh, I think it's slowly fading away. It, it seemed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was never convinced by it. Um, there are still some very interesting phases in the infrared, I think. Uh, it remains to be, I doubt one of them is this phase. There are other phases. With, uh, in fact, there are phases where the pairing disappears maybe and you get, you get more trivial sort of phases, but also quite interesting phases, but without the non abelian pair. Can I say that you see my Rana localized on a king? 
flick and uh, it's so strange for it to go around the room. I think the one day part is similar to that, where it's mm -hmm. at the end of a chain. So, so, right. so, so in one day, you know, you, you put it either you can think of the end of a chain or it's at the, at the boundary of some phases with a broken symmetry. So it's, uh, so that's not truly speaking any on. It's just, uh, yeah, it's something, it's something that around around the boundary. system around in some minimals. And yeah, this is a true any on if it was found. So I, I would say there's really no clear evidence for this kind of any on in the experiment so far. <laughs> this is a truly a non abutin any on, which would exist if you had the right the conditions that I just described. Quite general. Yeah. In computer, you will need to start moving these anions. Yes, of course. Where are you supposed to move them? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're asking the difficult question. <laughs> uh, well, it really depends on the system. I mean, I think so. I would say, you know, what I'm most excited by these days is uh, I think there's two papers coming out in uh, science, in, I, I think in next week or two, as far as I know. I'm a co author of one of them. Uh, one of them is by Google, where they take this, uh, um, take this, you know, the general purpose yeah. superconducting qubit computer, which has no error correction. I miss someone, no. But by uh, doing a lot of observations of, of qubits in just the right way, uh, they're projected into a Z2 projected state, a Toric code type state. Uh, and the rib book at a model I, I showed you earlier. <laughs> Okay, you need to mute yourself, Mr. Yang. <laughs> what did you say they do to get into a Z2 orbit? They make well, they do a lot of projective measurements uh, of the product of sigma x around the loop and product of sigma z around the loop, uh, and uh, that projects it into some kind of Z2 spin network. Yeah. Um, in the Ritbook model, well, if that is an actually, you just uh, adiabatically try to get to a ground state in the right regime, that could be a C2 spin liquid. So, so let's see, I think there's a lot of scope in improving that and maybe more artificially rather than naturally uh, building more complicated anions. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. In this discussion, where did you put in that it was PX plus IP uh, Well, just the fact that this is zero, non zero. So, uh, if, uh, yeah, where did it go? So so I had an expression for D of P. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if I just had real pairing, yeah. then D of P would only have two components. Okay. So it would be on a circle rather than on the sphere. But it could have been PX plus mm -hmm. I root two times P or Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. As long as this, there's a chert number. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a map from T2 uh, to R3 minus the origin. As long as that map is non trivial. Right. <laughs> does the X plus IPY have more symmetry? Yes. Uh, well, on the, on the lattice, it does, on the continuum, it does. Yeah, on yeah. the lattice, not really. I mean, it does have the fourfold rotation symmetry. Of, so just like, yeah. just like the D-wave superconductor, the kind of things you were discussing earlier, with the D-wave superconductor not breaking 90 degree rotation oh, symmetry. Exactly. Yeah, so, so PX plus RPY also doesn't break the 90 degree rotation symmetry. It's not obvious because the change is by R oh, if you write it. Yes. Uh, they only have a Z2 version. But there's also the globe, well, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, okay, now you have to do okay. the phase of quasi quasi rotation and the Z2 H. But does PX plus IP leave unbroken? Well, the Z2 really came from breaking a U1. I think maybe once you're gone for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Mr. is this, I mean, there, there, this seems quite different from Warren Reed's original approach, or am I? Oh, yes. <laughs> Is the idea that if one could go further with this if one wanted and derive Fafian states, or is this an orthogonal approach and this is more reflective of the current understanding? No, it's a, this, you can easily build a Fafian state out of this. We take the wave function of these objects in the limit of very weak pairing uh, and write down the BCS wave function and write it in real form. It is, in fact, just a Fafian state. Uh, yeah, so this is the Fafian state. Just written in a more general language. 
Yeah, no, I mean, uh, these, you know, Nick was in my office next door to me when he was doing this work and I, you know, I sort of regret I didn't see the connection much earlier <laughs> before it could have I suppose. Uh, because I was working on all this stuff and I didn't see it was all the same thing. It was hard to see, yes, initially. <laughs> Hopefully this, now you can see how simple it is. <laughs> this language, where does this debate about whether it's Parthian or this uh, sans, they come in. Yeah, so those are, yeah, so this particular uh, construction won't give those states. There's a Parthian, there's an anti Parthian, and this PH Parthian. Uh, I believe there are uh, part on constructions of those also, but they're more complicated. Than uh, if you want to know all of those, and uh, maybe Mike Levin or my son Barkeshli can tell you. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> the details. This is the simplest one. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you take the wave function px plus ipy, uh, once you take the right derivatives, it's basically one over z1 minus z2. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, if you just write down those. Uh, the BCS wave function in real space, symmetrized, anti symmetrized, take the long distance limit, it is just a Fafia. Oh, the BCS wave function is a Fafia in general. It's not one over Z1 minus Z2, it's something else. <laughs> Sorry, the BCS wave function of spinless fermions is just a Fafia <laughs> in general. <laughs> Here you're talking about the wave function for the electrons. Well, uh, uh, yes, but no, I'm talking about the wave function of the partons, but then in the end, of course, you have the coordinates of the partons, the coordinates of the electrons are identified. But you also get an extra factor of product of you know, the more rich wave function. Uh, yeah, so the more wave function is product on i less than j of z i minus z j squared times the Fafian of one over z i minus z j. So what I've been discussing is this part, the chiral spin liquid part is this part. And that's all. <laughs> and this is just the BCS wave function of spinless fermions with a down zero churn number. That's the important thing. <laughs> that's all you need. Okay, all right, good. Uh, 20 minutes left. Uh, maybe I'll just end early today because it's also quite late in India. <laughs> okay, we'll just start the conversation. Right. Yes, let's, uh, yeah, let's continue this discussion rather than starting a new topic. Yes. Can you summarize the various modes? I'm trying to build a dictionary in my mind. Yeah. The spin liquid was U1 level two, the Z2 spin liquid. No, no, Z2 spin liquid is not chiral. So the, so, the cut, sorry, the color one was you want to discuss. Yes, so let me try to so say this. Yeah, could summarize all the different models. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> in in this language, okay, okay. yes. So, well, if you can add more problems to the table in other languages, this would also help. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, which of the spin liquids? Well, all right. So, the, the simplest case is the chiral spin liquid. Uh, that's just uh, u1 level two uh, in the bulk and the edge, or you can also think of it as u2 level one. If we did it with the su2 gauge theory, which I have, which is in the notes actually, but I haven't done. Uh, then the z2 spin liquid. Uh, well, let's see, the, the bulk action is just one over pi uh, abb. So you can think of it as u1 cross u1. Um, where the uh, uh, the k matrix is 0, 2, 2, 0. As a yeah. This is also a z2 gauge. Uh -huh. This is also a z2 gauge. Yeah, that's so that's what the z2 spin liquid is. Uh, yeah. Then uh, this one, the Ising anion, actually, I don't know how to write it in this language. I told you what it is. It's a Z2 gauge theory coupled to uh, 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 
the zeta gauge field coupled to a fermion, which is in this, which has a chiral myron edge. There is a way to write it as some non abelian theory. Uh, probably you know how to do it, but <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I think Mason once sent me a long email explaining it, and I, I should go back and read it. The tool or it could be, yes. <laughs> so, what's, so what's the name of the table here? Uh, so the, you know, basically the, the Ising anions, which is a which is the Piteo model. So what I know that is, uh, it's basically has, a, uh, it's a fermion, a fermion with the churn number. So uh, let's see, it's a paired fermion in the bulk. In a churn number, say nu equals one, uh, and a zeta gate field. So that's the bulk theory. So how do I get this uh, out of uh, some Chen Simon's theory? I, I I think it's been done, and uh, maybe Fratkin's book is a way of doing it. But whenever I ask somebody, an expert, they give me a different answer. They don't understand. So I think it's been clarified. I don't I don't understand what people do in the literature. <laughs> you know the answer, nothing. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, another that is more read, which is different, right? Uh, more read, yeah, it's more complicated. You got to combine these two in some non-trivial way. So this this plus so basically more read is the sum of these two as both. But there's some constraints also on the quasi particles, right? <laughs> uh, another thing you might know is. Uh, like the quantum spin Hall state, which is the Kane, which is this, or the Kane Malay state, really, let's say Kane Malay in two dimensions. So that's topologically trivial, it has no any odds, but it has protected edge states uh, if you have time reversal symmetry. Uh, and I believe that's also U1 uh, cross U1. So, yeah, uh, with K as a I believe it was one minus one, or something like that. Uh, let me see. I know it's somewhere in my notes, I've forgotten, but I think that's right. It's just one edge state going this way and the other edge state going that way. So it's U1, one, one, and U1 one minus one. Can you say again how this one was called? This one? Yeah. It's the Kane Malay or the quantum spin hall state. So and so you have one edge state going this way and the other edge state going that way. So naively you would think, you know, the one, the topological number is Z. There's, you could have Z edge states this way or Z edge states. It was just churn number. Uh, but you also can have scattering between them. Uh, but as long as you have time reversal symmetry, uh, there's a Z2 invariant. So you always get, you can only get rid of them in even numbers. Not, so there's always just one. Uh, no, if you, you could go from three minus three to one, one, one minus one, but you, uh, or two minus two to one minus, or two minus two is just trivial, right? Uh, right, so that, this is, so this is different in the sense symmetry is important. This is an SPT state. You need to take into account global symmetry. These, there's no symmetry at all. There's no role, these are stable without any symmetry assumptions. I mean, if there was no symmetry, this is trivial. Because <laughs> the determinant of K is one. Okay. Um, yeah, so these are all the states I've talked about. They're various gapless states. But, and these are, you know, definitely the most important ones. <laughs> yeah. um, all of which have been seen, at least in reasonable physical models. Uh, we can't say that uh, in experiment yet. I mean, this is starting to be seen in experiment. I'm very excited about that. This so far, you know, we don't, there's no real indication. There's some indication of this. Of course, this has been seen very clearly, this one. <laughs> yeah. This was very helpful, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay then, any other questions online?
So uh, I don't know how it's working in India with respect to the late time. If, if it's a real problem, well, uh, then uh, we can go back to the old time and uh, I would have to do it online though completely, at least for the next two weeks. Uh, we'll see, no, I may do that. No, yeah. I think the classes are great, so we'll just join from home. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you'd like to be see me at the board rather than on a, on a tablet, right? I said. Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Okay, then I'll see you next on Wednesday. Sense, but the two of them too. Oh, it does make sense. No, exactly. This is about, yes, but that's not precisely the question I was asking. The Dirac equation, the lines with the visor at that point, like that. Unlike a lot of lines, always. So, so I have a, well, I've admit, actually, Taylor Hughes' book also in my notes, which have a discussion of uh, in the continuum how you see that there's a zero mode of the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can take some long way of limit and see there has to be a zero mode. Can you introduce the card by saying that it's equal to each field? There's a whole around it. Yes. And then you just couple with them. Okay. <laughs> I have to go to another meeting. So. Thank you. All right. If you're willing to pay the U1 gate, it will make it easy to see who pays. Well, various things go on. You see, if you simply embed Z2 and U1, then you're just going to have two family points. These maps are changing. It's important here that this one. I can't remember if I've ever done that. It's right now. I'll do it. Well, I can't remember what I, I read. I remember whatever, whatever I know the subject, I learned from you. <laughs> <laughs> you told me that. Is the fact that P plus IP is a fire around a zero mode? Yes. That's what we're discussing. Yeah. Oh, I'd be surprised if this cannot be done. Cannot be done. I will too. You might need to be to embed it in, in a more in a more complete microscopic system. I'll also be surprised right now. And I can't remember if I have it. Yeah. Regarding the symmetry that you asked yeah. the Z4 yeah. or the parameter, there's a Z4 and there's a Z2 gauge symmetry. Well, there was that as Sabir said that there was an underlying D1. Yes. And the rotation by pi of two is unbroken up to a gauge transformation. Yeah, but if, if it, well, whether there is a division, the, the system also has the underlying electrons yeah. and they carry charge one. Yeah. So it's the same as with the D wave superconductor. If you discuss only the order parameter, you might conclude that the rotation symmetry is unbroken. The gauge, the gauge one is always Higgs to Z2. Okay. Then you could ask, what about the rotation symmetry? If you discuss only the order parameter, yeah. you might think that the, the rotation symmetry is not broken yeah. because you can you have another rotation symmetry yeah. combining it with the gate symmetry. Yeah. But the system also has the electrons. Yeah. And the electrons see the rotation symmetry, the gate symmetry, different combinations of them. So if you are allowed to study both of them, you can tell the difference. <clears throat> Is that true? The D wave, uh, the electron spectrum, the Z4 was rotation. Right, but they carry the U1 charge. So when you say that you define the U Z4 symmetry, let's review what. Yeah, that's different than the electrons. That's the ordinary. 
That's right. That's really such a well, it's an unbroken C4. Oh, okay. The action of this is different. Than yes, that's right. Yes. I'm not quite sure. I was only asking. When I asked today, I was only asking whether <coughs> a psyche that I did have an interest in the treatment of the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. square matters. And he also told us that the eye is, but he also, well, he told us that it was clear from the lecture that one of the model has dextrose in there. It's not important to get into those more reads. Since the more that is got, you could change the PX plus IPY structure a little bit to make it. And this is a particular P wave or order and, and this is yeah. CX plus. Yeah. I guess because what condenses is just one field, right? Not two fields. Oh, one can yeah. yeah, one can. Yes. So that's yeah. why it has to have a really. There's something here that I'm confused by. He constantly uses fields with biolate spin statistics, and yet the resulting TQFT satisfies spin statistics in a sensible way. How did this happen? So you could have done the original thing with with the spin. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> In today's model, couldn't we give the three partons, psi one, psi two, and psi three, spins half, half, and minus half, and satisfy spins? Is that a question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what you gave. would be the same as some of these gauge centers. That's just a way to. I'm not even getting to subtle things like spin C, it somehow manages to, to, to appear in the end. Mm -hmm. I find these lectures way too stimulating. <laughs> the sense that I find myself thinking about it. <laughs> I really would be nice when the book is finished. I would love to see somebody write a book translating all that to the language of continuum quantum field theory. Oh. I would just like to understand this vortex at the moment. Uh, which vortex? Is well, the, the, see, if you have the Z2 algorithm around that point of the vortex, uh -huh. Uh -huh. on the lattice, there's no problem describing it. And as you said, a computer shows that. There's a localized fermion of zero right near the X. I, I would like to make, I expect that there should be a continuum model, mm -hmm. and there should be a version of the CLIAS index there that would predict that too much. But I can't remember if I've ever understood that, but right now I don't see how to do that. Basically, a field theory continuum description yes. of the, the reason it's hard to do is that AZ2 is, is a discrete group, so the whole number minus one is hard to unwrap in the continuum language. You can try to embed Z2 in something bigger where it can come out, but it tends to not work because that tends to force you to think even. Uh, there might be a way to do it, but I just haven't seen it. Very interesting. I'll have to remember. I, I, I was convinced till five minutes ago that you told me how to do that. I may have. It might be, if I did, I probably also wrote something about it. Yeah, I would not even be surprised if it's in our paper. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a little harder to remember things than you see. There must have been a lot of sirens in, in your area yesterday. Sirens? Well, there was oh, this, you know, this whole um, crazy event. What happened? Oh, with the stolen cars and deaths. And... People saw a car from down the street from us. When? Uh, yesterday. I'm told, but I don't know for sure, but, but the, the people had an expensive car in front of their house with the key inside. I heard that, but I don't know. 
I hope it's not happening. Anyway, the car was stolen, the people drove away recklessly, and had a crash, where people were killed. I don't know. There's some there. innocent person who was seen coming. It was right on 27 and uh, uh, which uh, Roper, 27 and Roper, like near the lake. Yesterday. Yesterday. Well, I didn't hear anything. We are not that far from there. Well, <laughs> your father and I were close to Dr. Bunker, I think. We saw it case faster than one of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but on Princeton News, there is huge uproar over the two, two people died, one criminal and one totally random person. Who was driving? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was basically <laughs> that That's not related. There was an accident on, on 27, the day or two ago, the 27 of no. that Is that random related? I was yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Uh, it was yesterday afternoon. And they closed the road. Apparently. I, I learned about it. Um, I think I heard something, but then in the evening, it just randomly showed up on my news feed. Crazy stuff is happening. <laughs> yeah, again, I find myself thinking about these things for doing work. <laughs> what does one have to do with this? And I think you need to upload your. I want to. And as long as you have a party, you can So I have to go to the second.